You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we've got a really special guest. Uh, I'm going to set the the backdrop here of how we met. Um, I was invited down to the, the Dale City Fishing Show uh, by the legend himself, Charlie Taylor of New Horizon uh, Fishing. And I had about 10 to 15 people tell me of, of your legend and this myth. And I need to I need to talk to you. And the hype was real because I think I was like across the flea market from you. And everyone told me I had to get with you and talk to you. And from there, I realized this really cool guy doing something that's taking the industry by storm. And there have been a couple people that do it and really, I think, Instagram famous. And I'm not meaning that in a negative way, like they don't do good work or anything, but they really publicize it down in Alabama of getting your boat professionally wired, um, doing power harnesses, things like that. Because the market's getting so crazy where, you know, I have three monitors here that are probably the same size as the ones that some of these pros are running on their bass boats. And you know, Greg Ravisky of New Horizon uh, boat electronics. I want to make sure I get that right. Uh, it's so cool that you're doing this and you're staying local. And I think you pretty much have the market cornered. And I just want to say thank you so much, not only for coming on the show, but he also rewired my boat. And I have it on good authority that that was the biggest nightmare of his life, which is uh, perfectly fine. I thought I, I was kind of thinking that's how it's going to be. <laughs> Greg, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so many things to get in. Like, I, I guess let, let's just get right into the meat of it here. How did this whole thing start for you? This idea of doing this and, and your background in fishing? Uh, so starting out, um, it was by chance. I actually was, uh, was drawn with, uh, Paul Gring of Pro Rigget Marine. Hmm. And, um, he's, uh, their business revolves around, uh, outfitting bass boats with electronics and everything that you can think of. And him and I talked and we actually have a background in electrical work. Uh, he has low voltage uh, experience and mine was through commercial construction. And him and I hit it off. And I mean, he inspired me to, to get into this. And, um, you know, we've been operating for a little bit over a year now. And we're, we've seen a great influx of bass boats coming in, yours included. And, um, uh, we've even branched in the saltwater boats. Yeah, it was it was funny when I dropped my boat off in in March. Uh, I I believe you were basically like flying out the night of or whatever to go work on a boat or something crazy like that, a saltwater boat, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, it was a 1991 Parker Sport Cabin. Dude, that's freaking awesome. And guys, I will be uh, once we get into that segment of the show, uh, I'm going to be bringing up some stuff from his Instagram that we can kind of scroll through and look at to see kind of his work. But you said, so basically less than two years, if I'm not mistaken, correct, that you've been doing this? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. That's insane how much your business has popped. I, I mean, did you just have one day you're driving down the road at midnight? And you're like, this is what I want to do. Was it kind of like that? Or was it more of like it just organically just kind of grew into what it is today? Uh, it, gr it grew into itself. Uh, once once I uh, talked with, with met Paul and, and, and him and I kind of, got to know each other and it, it to me it's I went wait a minute I've got all of this you know I've got over 10 years of experience being in and out of bass boats mm -hmm. um, and every make and model that you can think of and then I have a background in electrical uh, commercial construction and I have a journeyman's license and a master's license I was like why don't I just take those two and put them together and you know, it's part of it started off with my boat because I completely customized it and I built everything from the, you know, I installed everything from the talons to my helix units to my uh, uh, Garmin uh, live scope. And, and I had a real, uh, you know, just a real passion for it. And I, I said, I can't not do this for somebody else. And it's just, it's been one of the most rewarding uh, projects that I've I've really taken on in in quite some time. What kind of boat are you running? Uh, I've got a 2016 Nitro Z18. Ooh, dude, nice. Thank you. Now, 
I guess people are, let me see how we can approach this subject. When you're going into this, what is the competitive field like for your industry? Because I, I would assume nationally and regionally it's different. I'm assuming regionally you, you pretty much are it, correct? There, or there's very few. As far as a business that's ran like ours, uh, myself and Pro Rigget are the only ones in the immediate, well, actually in the state of Virginia. And um, I'm not aware of anyone north of us. And I mean, I'm talking like north, north, like, you know, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, there's no one that actually specializes in in electrical work, but into, into bass boats. That's crazy. Wow. Now I'd like to bring a scenario in there to see like why people might want this done. Um, and I'm going to use me as an example and let's just use uh, like, I'll, I'll make up an example here, but I have a boat that I believe it was built the same time the wall in Berlin fell and Ronald Reagan was president. It's not that old guys, but it's, it's a pretty old boat. And I think it's the same wiring too. And when you're dealing with that amount of wiring, that is a lot of issues that can go wrong. And I was having terrible issues that almost made it not fun to fish. Now, on top of that, we are, for better or worse, depending on how you feel about it, with, with live scope, forward-facing sonar, with 360 GPS, multiple graphs. You know, that is a lot of juice. And it's really important on these older boats, I think, specifically, because and we'll, we'll talk about the newer boats, too. There's a market for that. But I think for the most of us blue-collar people, you know, we're not going to run a brand new boat and we want to make sure our used boats can work to the best of their ability. And that's where you come in. I mean, is that, is that about right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What is it about this that you do specifically? And I really want you to get into the, just the, the meat of it here about the electronical portions of it. So I'll just let you just go for it. So the, the biggest issue you'll ever deal with when you're dealing with electronics is heat and voltage drop. Now, because of we're basically running, you know, marine computers. Uh, That's a good and, way of putting it. I like that. Yeah. And the, uh, the voltage is 12 volts, between 12 and 16, give or take. Uh, you can kind of take heat out of the equation, but what really becomes the player is the voltage drop, which we've seen a few companies around the fishing industry that have come out with the universal wiring harness mm -hmm. and what'll happen is right at your source at your battery and this applies and this is very intricate when it comes i mean this is very detail specific when it comes to dc voltage as opposed to ac you've got 12 volts at your source the further away your equipment is the slower uh your your voltage is actually going to be you have to think of it as almost is you're shooting a gun your terminal velocity is greatest right at the barrel and as it exits it starts it starts to slow down the further and further it gets away and it's the same principle in electrical theory voltage drop correct yep so you might have 12 volts at the source but once you actually get to your equipment which might be 10 15 20 feet away you might have 11.8 11.9 granted your conductors are smaller so if you're dealing with 12 14 16 so say yourself you run a 15 helix up on your bell correct yes so a uh, unit of that that size it draws usually around anywhere between three to six and a half amps what'll happen and because of that is voltage is indirectly proportionate so the lower the voltage the higher the amperage flip-flop that higher the uh higher the amperage lower the voltage mm -hmm. and it can actually call it you can start having a lot of interference in your electronics if you do not have the exact over 12 volts the processors and these electronics are very um thickly thick, yeah sensitive um, that if you're, you'll notice a decreased speed in your processor, uh, your picture might become a little fuzzy, not as clear, not as responsive. And one of the things I do is I make sure I put all the research into whatever electronics that I'm going to install 
So I can measure out the distance. I can find the manufacturer's uh, recommended, uh, basically run through the specs and find out what the amperage rate is going to be. And then I can do the calculations and you'll make I'll always make sure that you have the appropriate conductors installed to actually prevent voltage drop. So you're, you're never under 12 volts. For, for people that are listening on Apple, Spotify, our heart radio, um, that really, could you explain to them draw and let's get really into these definitions for the people that aren't fluent, um, uh, in this specifically, what is draw? So draw is relating to your amperage. Um, the best way I can describe that is say you have a water hose and you've got water pressure. Well, the water pressure would be in relation to your voltage, mm. the water that's leaving your spout. That would be the amperage. So basically your amperage is what is, uh, what is generated and consumed, uh, by the equipment that you're using. So it takes 12 volts to operate, but it'll be actually, it's basically, it's a unit of measurement for the power it's con consuming. Interesting. Okay. And then we, and the other thing I, I, is diameter play a factor into it when it comes to the wiring? Cause would you want a thicker wire gauge depending on the distance you have to travel? So you have less drop. Does that play any factor into it? Uh, oh, absolutely. So one of the ways to prevent voltage drop is to increase the diameter of the uh, conductor itself. Now, everything that we use that's under uh, 10 volt, or excuse me, under 10 uh, AWG, it's gonna be stranded. Um, and those stranded conductors, uh, one, it's much easier to play with. Uh, it's more malleable than say a solid conductor. And we'll, I'm not going to get into the NEC because we can really be here for a while. But by increasing the diameter and the size of the uh, the conductor itself, you're permitting a uh, less of a voltage drop rate. So instead of running something a six, you know, 16 gauge, we're running 10 for the branch circuit, which is branching off of the panel to, or from your sub panel to your equipment, and then you have your feeder which I upsize that in, accord in accordance with, with all the calculations that I do um, to actually feed the panel. And it, it's feeding overall every, uh, you know, piece of marine electronic that you'll actually have on your, on your boat. A lot of times I hear people about, they try to skimp on things and, and maybe skimping is the wrong word. You guys killing the comment section. It's, it's, it's been a long day. Um, they try to cut costs at different areas. And, and I see this a lot. I had this issue too. I'm not going to lie. You know, I'm not bawling uh, when it comes to the money situation. So you get to save up to get the forward facing center, the 360, what have you, uh, pick your poison. And then you're like, crap. Well, you know what? It'll be fine. And I think that was like, that was something in my brain uh, before we started this conversation. I was thinking about like, what was my experiences before I met with you? And it's like, well, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll do this. This is how I can make this work and cut corners. And you really can't like, it's so important to really make sure the wiring and the power is correct. So when the metal meets the meat and you're out there on a Saturday tournament fishing, everything goes according to plan. But I feel like so many people, and, and, and maybe it is just purely financial. This is the part they skimp on. Uh, it's that, or going with a smaller screen size when it comes to the electronic portion. And in my my personal opinion, if do whatever you can do to go with the bigger size screen, you get better, better resolution, you can fit more data onto a screen. You're generally always happier with the 12 compared to with the 10 inch. Um, that's, that's where I've, 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 that's where my opinion falls. But so, you know, with that said, I mean, let, let's try to like even break it down further. Um, when it comes to batteries, lithium is hot right now. And I, and I think there's, I, I know there's some reasons I think for that. One thing is like, it's sexy right now. I think the future is not going to be lithium. It's probably going to be solid state, but we are like, that is way down the road before that becomes even practically priced for us. So lithium is the best thing we have when it comes to capacity. Um, you know, 
what, what do you think of though the lithium battery market compared to AGMs, things like that? Um, cause there's one topic I want to get into that. And I feel like a lot of times people that are on social media, they do promote brands and they do sell products, but you don't know if it's actually the best product. And what I'm going to talk about is Millican runs a, I think it's a 16 volt or 17 volt lithium battery. And I think that's interesting that he's doing that. And why not talk to a professional like you and ask, like, is that the best idea? Why would you do that? So I give it to you. Well, I do know of one other person who's running us. I, I believe it's a 17 or 18 volt uh, Milwaukee for their Garmin live scope. Um, really? Yeah. Local guy too. Now, uh, the drill. Yeah, it's it's yeah, like the Milwaukee, the power tool. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it. I it was described to me, and I was like, that's pretty cool. I want to see that. Yeah. Um, so as far as the lithium batteries go, I think they are in the right area as far as efficiency goes for trolling motor batteries. So for basically what would be your deep cycle, mm -hmm. um, I have not found anyone yet. I have not read a review uh, that's positive for a lithium starting battery. Mm. Um, I, as far as the engineering behind that, I'm not, I, I don't, I, I can't, I can't talk much about it. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but when it comes to running electronics off of a lithium battery or your trolling motor, I think it's a great option. Um, I'm still a fan of the AGM batteries. They're priced a lot better than what lithium is. I feel like lithium has been kind of over marketed, especially yeah. on social media and through, you know, several, you know, aspects of, you know, professional bass fishing. Cause it's huge. I mean, it's like you, you don't turn on any sort of, live show without hearing something about the lithium plug at some point. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a lot of hoopla, but I do think it's a little oversaturated. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think there are places for it. And, and like examples, a kayak is a great example where you are going to save weight. And I think weight makes a huge difference on a kayak versus a, a 22 foot Falcon boat or something like that. Yeah. Um, just, just to tie a bow on what we just talked about though. So lithium great for a trolling motor. If you want to just hook up your electronics with that's fine. The issue is cranking battery. That's going to be the, ooh, this probably is not the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of it has to do with large bursts of power. And when you're trying the turnover of, you know, a, an outboard engine that's 150 horsepower or 250 horsepower, uh, that's, that takes a great deal of power. And with the way, with the way bat the starting batteries are compared to the, the deep cycles, the, the deep cycle can actually hold a, a it, it'll hold, hold a charge a lot, lot, a lot further, a lot longer, but it's not there for a rapid discharge. It's, mo you know, momentarily on, momentarily off. As a starting battery, it can take that large, you know, expulsion of power and it'll still have, you know, a capacity for the remainder of the day um and just with the way you know lithiums aren't there quite yet but they make a great trolling motor battery they take up a lot less space they'll they'll hold uh they'll hold a charge for an you know ungodly amount of time do you and this is something i saw I, and guys so you know full disclosure here like i run a ranger it's a 2000 and three 2002 ranger uh two-stroke engine oil well in the back so space is tight there are some boat companies an example would be like falcon i i it would be great to have somebody on the show that actually works for them to ask this question but it'd be like it looks like they made the back of their boat designed to hold more batteries and you look at a john cox and i think it was a shryock where they're going with six plus batteries do you think that's going to be a wave in the future if you're a betting man in five to 10 years that boats will be designed to hold more batteries? Because I feel like that's a big hiccup with a lot of people with electronics and a cranking batteries. There's, there's, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of room. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of 50, 50 on that. The, I, I'm not sure if we'll, you'll, you'll see people running, you know, six graphs and all of the, you know, accessories that actually have to be installed, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to make the, that, that possible to make that outfit possible. Um, now with all bass boats running on off of, you know, four stroke motor, uh, outboards, I mean, you took away that oil reserve, you're inherently going to have more space due to that now. Um, so the option of running or having, you know, more batteries in your compartment, you know, it's not out of the question, but I don't know if that'll be a regular occurrence, especially with, you know, say anyone who's not on the elite series or, you know, the bass opens or, you know, MLF or anything of that nature. Yeah, it just always just fascinating to me because like, you know, they set the market and what else we get. And it's like, well, if you had to design the perfect back end of the boat, I, you know, I would assume you would want probably what two like a perfect world money is no object. One battery specifically just for cranking and accessories, mm -hmm. and then two 12 volts in parallel for all your electronics, and then you have your trolling motor set on the other side. Would that be like the perfect money doesn't matter setup? Uh, well, I mean, you could eliminate one of those batteries by going to a, a, a hundred amp hour uh, mm -hmm. multi-purpose battery. So therefore you would have your starting battery, you would have your uh, electronics battery with which if you have, if you can afford a lithium battery that has a hundred amp hour capacity, uh, that's, you can run at a, a great deal of electronics off of that and still have plenty of power left over. That's something we did not touch on. It's really good. What would be the amp hours just for people at home that don't understand, or like when you talk about a hundred amp hour AGM or, or whatnot? So that's going to vary depending on the electronics you're going to run. So say with the every, you know, we'll say someone owns a bass boat and they have one graph at your console two graphs up front of the bell. You could get away with having a 50 amp hour um, uh, lithium battery or a AGM battery that's a group 27 or a group 31. Um, that right there would, you know, I mean, that, that would be, that would be efficient. Now, if you were going to go to something a little more serious to where you're running, you know, two 12 inch graphs at your console, three 12 inch, or maybe two 12 inch up front on your bow, um, then you might want to go with a hundred amp, but it all depends on the manufacturer, um, the amount of electronics that you're going to carry. Um, and, you know, also, you know, let's not forget if you, you know, if you say you run, you know, Humminbird, uh, you have to provide power for your Ethernet hub. So, I mean, it's everything that kind of goes in, into uh, whatever your desired outfit's going to be. It basically has to be customizable. So, so um, that, that, that's so important. And, and the customizable object of what you do is so important because like we mentioned, there are places there are places in the United States that will that will build you custom harnesses and all that, um, and they're not local. So you have to drive your boat to certain places in the country to do that. Versus if you're in Northern Virginia, this is fantastic because it's not just a phone call. You can deliver the boat in a day, and you can talk to Greg, and you can have somebody there, you know, to help you with the whole process, which is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, another you know another great aspect is. Um, we offer consultation service. So if you're in the market to have uh, you know, a, a new trolling motor, shallow water anchors, or if you wanna go in the forward facing sonar or any of the electronic brands, you can call us and we'll actually take the time and figure out exactly what uh, you'll need. So, I mean, we can base that off of what rivers you fish or what, you know, if you spend more time on, you know, inland lakes, if you're a tournament fisherman, if you do, if you're more regional or if you're more local, um, or if you just, you know, spend more time on the Aquapon River off the Potomac, um, it, it, then it can really, you know, we can get to the point I can say here, this is, this is what's going to best serve you. 
and you know we can get you the best deal that we can on electronics and i take that time to actually go through any any vendor that i can to actually get you a great price um which is you, it's very hard to come by it is it, it really is um and then you know what let's just i want to actually kind of get kind of get into the, the funner part of this where we get to actually just look at some of the jobs that you've done. Uh, let me get this up here and ba boom, we're going to go split screen. There we go. So you tell me if there's any specific one story wise that you would like to tell. Uh, and we will, we will blow that image up. Hmm. Well, you can actually go ahead and scroll all the way up. Uh, if you see that center one with the uh, the radome, this one. Oh, oh, Garmin. Yes. Here we go. Ooh. All right. So, what are we dealing with here? So that was a pretty special project, and I actually started on that one uh, as soon as I I handed you uh, the keys to your boat. Um, oh. So with this, we had a 1991 Parker uh, located off uh, just east of the York River. Um, and the captain called us up and uh, said that he just bought this, this Parker. He wanted a uh, Garmin 8616 uh, XSV installed. And he also wanted radar. Um, so we went through Garmin. I talked with several, several reps and we got his, uh, his needs met. And we ended up with a uh, 24 XHD uh, radome um, that gives a range out to, I think, 20 or 30 miles. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and we've gone through and we had that uh, connected and uh, where it's compatible with the 8616 um, for, uh, Saltwater uses out in the uh, out in the mouth mouth of the Chesapeake. How much how much juice does that thing take? Uh, I believe. Does that run its own battery, just specifically just for that? Uh, no, we actually had that in the Garmin wired to a, uh, a house battery. Um, now the thing with the saltwater boats is you're ninety percent of the time your outboard is on recharging your battery via the alternator. Um, so you have about 14 volts off of your electronics at any given time. Mm. Um, so you're right there, you eliminated your voltage drop and you've got a, uh, basically a, I mean, if you want to call it a gasoline generator running, much. running your batteries for the day. Dude, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. I know there's one there we go. and then we'll, we'll, we'll save the, we'll save mine. Since it's the best for last. Um, Oh dude, this is the picture. I think you had this at the, um, the Dale city show. This is Colleen. Thank you. Um, talk, talk, just really just talk through just for the people that are watching on YouTube, what, what we're looking at here, you got your main power switch, right? And then this is something that you do completely. You customize it, label it and everything. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, this was a uh, this was a 2021 uh, Phoenix 920 Elite. Uh, we did a couple months ago. Um, the gentleman called me up and was saying that, hey, my electronics just aren't responding or running the way that they should be. I don't feel like it's right. So we we took a look and ran throughout and traced all out all of the uh, circuits on the Phoenix. Um, and it was a clean, it was a clean install, and I've I've been pretty happy with what Phoenix has done with their bass boats. Um, it's very easy to access anything that you're going to need to get to. Um, so what we did there is we ran uh, independent branch circuits to each. Uh, um, there's one, two. Lorance HDS 12s, one at the console, one at the bell, and then also a Garmin 126 uh, XSV up front um, for dedicated for LifeScope. Um, and 
what you see there in red, uh, everything is labeled, um, every circuit is labeled numerically and alphabetically. Um, wow. So what you can do is you'll go say, hey, you know, I think a fuse is blown. You'll remove your panel cover uh, and you can relate, num say, you know, the top left would be circuit number one. And that might be your, say, your Garmin. And you can actually go up to your uh, bow panel, remove that, and you'll see exactly what circuit is tied in with your Garmin power. So you don't have to worry about tracing things out. It's been traced out for you and labeled. Dude, that is just, that's worth every damn penny. It really is. Yeah, because, I mean, you would be amazed at the amount of wiring that you'll find in a bass boat just from the factory. And it's just off of the accessories so like your horn and bilge pump and live wells it's in, it's incredible the amount of wires that you'll actually come in come into dude i do not envy your job at all for some of these things i mean we're gonna get to the worst case horror story here in a minute um and then you got this set up here and i believe these are uh these are lithiums correct yep huh. yeah. did you do anything different when you approach wiring a lithium battery versus an agm or lead acid um no, it's it's the same install. Uh, one thing that to keep in mind uh, is if your charger is compatible with your lithiums, um, and to make sure that every lithium that you're wiring, if it is in parallel or series, that uh, it's made by the same manufacturer, it's the same amperage rating. Um, you do not want to mix and match the uh, lithium batteries basically have a processor that monitors the uh, battery itself, hmm. and those can fry up if you mix and match uh, battery types. So that's something to keep in mind completely. That's a really good tip, actually, for people listening at home. That is that. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Uh, let me get this here. And then there's another one I wanted to look at, too. Where did it go? It just disappeared on me. How do you like when you when you do this? Um, how long does it take you, generally speaking, when when we look at this setup right here, super clean? Um, how long does it take you start to finish to do a? And I know this is so hard for for people in your position to do, and I know you get this question a bunch, but for the people that want to get their boat done with you unless it's a nightmare like mine generally speaking is this take a month to wire a boat does it take a week to wire a boat what is the what is the worst case scenario versus best case scenario uh generally um if it's just wiring um that can take anywhere from four to eight hours give or take um if it's an install project plus wiring um that can take up to 16 um but i when when I, I when I start my work, I'll work until until it's finished. I, I can say with your ranger, um, I was working from seven to ten each night, and then I actually finished it up at one a.m. the uh, the the night before it was ready to be picked up. Um, but say like the terminations and the panel and switch mounting, as you see right there, uh, that took about two and a half two and a half hours, a little bit over that that's freaking insane and then guys and i say the best for last or the or, or he earned his pay with this one let me find it oh there it is all right so that's what we got here so i guess we gotta start in the back uh back 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 where's the back there's the back so wait wrong i guess we'll start with the other one there we go okay so back of the boat um you know right now i got optimus in the back maybe i'll go to lithium someday uh i went with the the everyone i guys i know the comment section here is going to get me with this the power pole charge i'm not completely sold on yet i'm a little nervous with there's too much technology in that and if it fails i'm nervous i like the idea of everything just being sectioned and nothing can go wrong everything separate so when when minkota came out with the five bank i was sold on that where everyone gets their own battery and i don't have to deal with it i think in five five more years once power pole really perfects it and other companies come out with the technology then I'll probably go to a charger like that. Um, 
I don't know, like, what are your thoughts on the power pole charge? Like, I'm not saying it's bad. I just have this weird, like, apprehension about it. Um, from all of the tournaments that I fished and the clients that I've had, I've actually only met one person uh, who runs. Uh, no, I take that back. I've met two who have the power pole charge, and they love it. Hmm. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're a big fan. They, they love the fact that they can actually monitor their battery capacity that and is. they can tell when their batteries are going to be charged from the, you know, convenience of their phone in the hotel room or, you know, in their house. Um, that's about as much as I have on that. Now, this one right here was an absolute nightmare. I came to this poor man to, to fix up this boat. It, and there's something about the Ranger cool we could hit on too, because I think this will be a fun little segment as well to talk about, which is which boat brands are, are tough. But this boat specifically, I'm running Garmin up front. Uh, as you guys can see, uh, I have a 15 inch unit uh, because of the model that I have when it comes to the graph mount and everything. Uh, that's why it was mounted that way, correct? Where it looks the bigger ones on top versus the bottom. Um, this was a hell of a project you had uh, to deal with. And I'll just since this is probably your Vietnam, I'll just let you uh, let you talk about it and let me tell me which pictures you want me to jump to. Uh, well, that one actually, I had the before and after of the bow. Um, if you scroll through that, let's get right here. Ooh, wrong way. What's going on? Right there. Oh, there we go. I got to be inside it. Yeah, if you go back one. Right there. Yeah, so that's what we started off with. So yeah, walk me through this bad boy. So this is where you're at day one. Yeah, so with, uh, yeah, starting off with this, uh, I actually, I'll go through and I will cut every zip tie that I can see. Ooh, okay. um, and then I'll go through and I'll trace out every, uh, every wire uh, individually and make sure that it's labeled uh, to and from so I know where it came from. I know what it belongs to. Um, and then after that, once I get everything cleaned up and organized, uh, I make sure I go through and I pull my feet uh, for well, my branch circuits. And then uh, I do my power connections and then I start mounting. Um, that's that's usually my first to, first to last step as far as tackling something like that. Um, and it's not as bad as you look, it's a little overwhelming. Uh, you might think just from the amount of wires that you see, but uh, knowing that you have one transducer plug um, for for your helix, um, it was basically just kind of keeping everything, you know, in a neat and orderly fashion. Yeah, I guess go to the left. Oh, and we'll talk about this too. So this is where you mounted the um, the black box. Yes. Yep. So with uh, that uh, Ranger specifically. Um, you do not have a clear shot from the rod blocker up to your bow panel. Um, so uh, Ranger, I think, is definitely the most difficult boat to work with just for the fact that you it is foam filled. The entire mm -hmm. hull is filled of, you know, I guess that's EVA foam. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and they provide a conduit. Uh, that runs along the gunnel on each side. So when your port side will be reserved for your trolling motor conductors, and then on the starboard side, all of your electronics and et cetera. Um, so I went through and I actually mounted the GLS 10 to the floor, and then I kept the wiring uh, as clean as I possibly could and, and tucked away. So you still have the functionality of a rod blocker, but your uh, your accessory, your electronics panel is located directly uh, above that. Uh, so everything's in its own central location. And again, uh, the brain circuits are labeled numerically. Um, and then you also receive the uh, panel schedule. So when, you know, you can keep in your glove box. So when you're on the fly and say, hey, I need, you know, to replace a fuse or I need to trace something out, it's right there ready for you to go. So, dude, I, this the work you put into this. And you can go back to here now. 
And then this is where I was impressed. I didn't know how the hell you fit a battery in there. That looked like it must have been miserable to get all that stuff squared away. It went in on the first try. How did you do that? Don't ask. <laughs> I have no clue. Oh um, my gosh. You know, I went through and I removed your starting battery, um, which uh, I don't know if you know this, but you actually are running two deep cycles. Um, you oh, definitely wow. want to have a starting battery as your, um, as the, um, battery dedicated to your motor um not necessarily the deep cycle those are more for trolling motor and electronics um but i was able to get everything to fit i made sure i you know i double checked the measurements for the uh, battery trays and um yeah so we had the feeds uh for the electronic panel uh labeled uh so it's easily identifiable uh, you've got a 250 volt uh, rated uh, uh, master marine switch, and that would uh, be directly uh, just for your electronics and your GLS 10 module and um, your Ethernet hub, your 360. Uh, so everything is controlled directly through that. It's absolutely clean. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, guys, I know the comment section, I am going to upgrade the batteries hopefully soon uh, a bit like not this year, but hopefully next year um, to get a completely updated there with the power. But honestly, I was like, I was pretty happy with like the power coming from a Walmart battery of all things. Like, and that's, what's been crazy is I fished four tournaments right now. I've put some time on it and I haven't had an issue. And it shows you just like you said earlier, you don't necessarily have to buy a $1,200 battery to have fun and make things work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, I mean, on a, on my boat in particular, I'm still running one starting battery. Um, and that's powering all of my electronics live scope included um and i have yet to have a day where you know my motor won't crank over <clears throat> but it's a group i mean and it's a lead acid i actually haven't upgraded that one battery yet in my in in, in my setup that's freaking awesome dude yeah I mean, guys, as and as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. So you can kind of get in with this guy. He does great work. He'll make your boat run without a problem. Um, I mean, heck, he got my boat up and running. And I thought that thing was just impossible to actually deal with. One, one thing you mentioned interesting about Rangers being the hardest boat. Like, what what if Rangers the hardest boat, what's the easier models to work on? Um, I would say Nitro their compartments especially when it comes to the battery compartments are super open um there's a ton of space and then with your uh your uh rear compartments you can actually remove the uh the trays that are in those compartments so that opens up even more space. So when it comes to pulling wire or mounting panels or any accessories, it's you have you have options. That's really interesting, huh? That's good yeah. to know, guys. You behind you have a little bit of hardware, and I think this is something that people will be remiss that you don't just work on the boats; you actually fish and have a history with that. And I think this mm -hmm. is going to be a lot of fun to get into like what what is your history because i think we even brushed over this how did you come up with the name of your company so i actually named new horizon boat builds after new horizon bass anglers which i was a i've been a club member with new horizon for i think this is my 12th year wow um but i actually started i, I lived in northern virginia for the majority of my life and uh, I was I fished the uh, Stonebridge and Broad Run high school tournaments. Um, oh, dude! So uh, I'm sure, I mean you know Matt McCluskey. Um, mm -hmm. I've I I met him. Um, him and I are friends. I I met Matt back in 2009 for the first time. Really? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we all we all grew up fishing the same uh, ponds in in Ashburn. You're kidding. Oh my God. Yeah. Do you have any stories about him? 
Uh, he's he's a he's a hell of a stick. Uh, he took me out actually on the Aquapon River about five years ago, and that was I mean that was like it was like a it, that was a nice guided day. But it was uh, I mean that was back when it was just starting to to take off, and now it just looks like it's full fledged gone. You know, in, insane as far as quality goes. Dude, that's so cool. That's so crazy that you grew up fishing in a- like where did you fish in Ashburn? Like just ponds before the cops came or uh I may have or may not have trespassed on Belmont Country Club. Uh, <laughs> good, uh I, I spent a lot of time on any golf course pond I could find or um I mean, you know, Lansdowne Golf Club is their their ponds are great and Belmont Country Club has aw- awesome you know, farm pond fisheries hmm. and then all of the uh, locally stocked uh, places. And that's, I mean, that's actually where, where that, that came from, from 20 years ago, but. Um, really? What's the story there? Uh, I was in the third grade, I believe. And uh, my dad took me pond fishing in Ashburn. Um, I ended up hooking into this one which was maybe two and a half pounds but to my dad who didn't really you know he was he was the you know take the kids fishing every now and then type dad um you know that that was like 10 pounds to him so he wanted to he wanted to have that mounted back when it was still acceptable to do so and uh yeah yeah we've i've i've always had that in the trophy case ever since dude that's so freaking cool yeah like that's so neat that that memory now gets to live on forever yeah and and then so from fishing farm ponds in Ashburn and, and golf courses and then going to New Horizon, when did you when was this huge jump for you then to where like it looks like you have one hell of a trophy case? Yeah, yeah I started tournament fishing um, through uh, Ernie Rojas's uh, tournaments that he put on. And once I fished the first one in 2010, 2009. I wanted to have my foot in the door on any organization I could find. And it didn't matter if they were paying anything or if they paid a, you know, a, you know, a good check. I just wanted to be able to compete. Um, so I started fishing with the Bass Federation um, throughout Virginia. So, you know, I was getting to travel the Kerr and the Potomac and the Chick. And I, fished the so I was with the TBF uh, then Ernie put me in contact uh, with New Horizon and at that time I was right in the middle of my senior year of high school and oh, wow. I at that point found out that I wasn't going to college and I had not a clue what was going to go on with you know, starting my life off and I'm 17 and that's a, you know, I mean, that's a pretty big trend. That's your first big transition. Sorry, honey. Mm-hmm. And, um, they kind of pointed me in the right direction and, you know, any ideas I had, uh, you know, I became really close friends with about three members and, you know, life choices or potential careers. I would bounce ideas off of them and they, you know, they would help me with, you know, they would give me all the feedback that was possible. Um, so, you know, looping back to, to New Horizon Boat Builds, I, when I named the, named the business, I went, I want to be able to give back. So I was, why not, why not? It's bass fishing, it's electrical work, and all of that, you know, was, you know, uh, was made to happen by, you know, the individuals in New Horizon. That's really cool. So what, is that just all from co-angling or boating as well? Uh, it's it's a mixture, uh, mostly the TBF tournaments um, up top and in, in blue. Uh, those are it's a boater, and then the FLW and the uh, major league fishing uh, events. Those are all uh, co angler events. Okay, y'all, you know this is coming next. If you had to pick one of those, which which one has the fondest memory to you? Uh, it would probably be uh, the. Lake Lanier Trophy from uh, the FLW Tour uh, back in 20... Was you fished the FLW Tour co-angler. Yeah, I actually... Um, Dude, that's awesome. So this is... and That and the All-American Trophy um, right here. That's those, those two are probably the most, you know, memory-full 
uh, pieces of hardware that I own. And basically the all American uh, is the reason why I have the FLW tour. And what had happened is I double qualified for the all American in 2016 um, through uh, the Piedmont and Shenandoah division. And I make it to the all American day two comes and I get drawn with Justin Atkins, who's lead series pro that Justin Atkins. Pretty good. Yeah. And uh, Justin and I hit it off. Uh, he was working with Johnson Outdoors at the time as a hydrographic surveyor. Uh, so he's basically creating maps for Lake Master. And uh, at the time, I lived up in Ashburn, so I was very familiar with Potomac. And, you know, I said, hey, Justin, anything I can do to help you move, you know, help you get ahead, uh, you know, help you succeed, I will. <laughs> And I said, could you put me in contact with someone with Johnson? He says, sure thing. Uh, so a month later, I'm actually on a plane flying up to uh, Detroit to go s survey uh, St. Clair. That's so cool. So I got to uh, I got to spend a year with with Johnson Outdoors and I got to travel all over the country and survey lakes from, you know, Texas and Oklahoma, Arkansas, all the way up to Minnesota in November. Um, so, I mean, that was a wonderful experience, but that gave me the opportunity uh, the following year to fully commit to the FLW tour. And that was, and that was in 2018. And that was the last year that they had the co uh position uh, to where, I mean, you could possibly fish with anyone from, you know, Scott Martin to, uh, you know, Jimmy Reese uh, wow. or, you know, I fish with Michael Neal, Justin Lucas, Chad Grigsby, Clifford Perch. Um, I've been able to be in a lot of, uh, I, I think I fished with over between 20 to 25 uh, pros in the past 10, 11 years. What was something you really learned and picked up from that time? Um, those. I know it's a loaded question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's a tricky one. Um, what sticks out to you? They're very much like all of us. There's, there's not really they're humans. <laughs> exactly. And, um, I mean, just, you know, I fish with, uh, Luke Lawson and, and just the cool minded, uh, just kind of laid back way that he had about, about, you know, his approach to fishing was you, you would never see any one of those top guys get flustered or agitated or lose their cool. They were just very in the moment, relaxed. It made the whole eight hours of that tournament just feel like eight hours versus like we've had the, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had some of those moments where you start to rush and it's, you know, yeah. it goes from seven o'clock to two and I'm, you know, in, in a heartbeat real quick. Yeah. Yeah. How do you prep for a co-angler thing? Especially like, I mean, it's one thing if you're a co-angler on a lake by your house and you know the lake, dude, you're almost doing it like a professional co-angler, which used to be a thing. You could win a lot of money doing that. So like, do you have any tips for kids at home that want to be a co-angler? I mean, like, just go for it. The, the le least amount of tackle that you can take with you. I hear that a lot. The more successful you're going to be. I take, really? I take five rods no more, no less. And I take one tackle bag and it's a mid-size bag. It's right here, actually. Oh, wow. It's it. That's the original co-angler bag I've had for 13 years, but a little beat up, but it still works. But um, yeah. Why, I, why I, the minimalist approach? Why is that so important? It, it, I don't have too many ideas. And the way my brain operates is the more the more variables you throw in front of me, the more I'm trying to analyze that and I'm throwing that into my decision making equation. And it will it and I, I spend too much time trying to to analyze everything and trying to break stuff down and it, it kind of over floods my mind. So the you know, I, I take, you know. 
you know, four bait casters and one spinning rod. And I take something that I know that I can, from the back of the boat, that I can catch fish on a conservative approach. Um, I can, I want to get the most bites. I might not win a tournament, but I'm going to be in the top 10 because a limit goes a long way in a co-angler event, in any co-angler event. It's um, so important what you just said there. And I just, I literally just wrote it down. It, it limits the amount of ideas you can have because I feel like one thing about the John Cox and what he does. And I remember the last tournament he won on Toyota. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the MLF FLW tour. Um, he was swimming a jig around docks. Everyone else was using live scope forward facing sonar. And he laughed that like he literally had it in his car because Lawrence gave it to him, but he didn't put it on. Uh, it, it just, and his idea was like, I don't have to worry about it because it's not on the boat. A and it's like, it just, for some reason that linked up with what you said is like, it limits your ideas. This is mm -hmm. what I'm going to do and I'm going to make it work. Right. Right. And, and you know, I mean, I've met, uh, I mean, as recent as the last, uh, uh, BFL that I fished on Kerr, um, my friend who was rooming with us, <coughs> uh, he was, he had 10 rods he was sorting through at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. And I was doing, taking, you know, making the final touches on my bag. Now I, I, that was a terrible event. He finished 10th, but it was just kind of overwhelming for him saying, oh, well, if I take, I can take a Ned rig and I'll take a drop shot and I'll take a, you know, a wacky worm. And I'm saying, well, you're condensed to the port side rod, open rod locker, if you will. You're not going to fit nine or 10 rods there. If you take five, you it's, it's organized, it's clean. When I need something, I know it's right there. I don't have to go through a mess. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's only so many productive colors. Green pumpkin, June bug, watermelon, red and black flake. You know, I try and even keep my soft plastic uh, uh, lineup as, you know, as minimum as possible. Just because it, you know, it, it's when you're not worried about if they're going to eat watermelon candy versus green pumpkin. It's just. You can go down the rabbit hole. And Jared, yeah. Jared Mounts of uh, Jake's Bait and Tackle has talked about this when we went to ICAST. Like how much of it is these colors are to catch fishermen and not fish. Exactly. I, mean, like, I think there's something to that. There really is. Now, you also had that experience of graphing all over God's earth. Mm -hmm. Have you picked up any tips in general when it comes to just electronics that, that you could share? And it doesn't have to be like world shattering ones. Um, I definitely, I've spent a lot of time idling with, uh, you know, with side imaging and down imaging. Um, you know, I keep my settings fairly simple as far as with my, you know, my color palette. Um, and that's kind of a user preference and it depends on your, how, you, you know, how your eyes are. Um, mm. some go with, you know, that say with hummingbird, you have the palette, which is the more, uh, amber sort, sort of color. Some people go with the purple, some go with, with uh, which is, I guess called lava. And then you have, you know, some with the moss background or palette, um, I st I've stuck. I've always stuck with the amber for at least the past five years. Um, I don't do a whole lot of modifications or a lot of adjustments with my sensitivity and contrast. Um, I keep that relatively about two or three uh, percentage points above or below, um, so I don't have anything that's kind of blowing out or really, you know, um, adding too much uh interference with with my feet with the image that i'm getting feedback on um forward facing sonar if you go on youtube you can find every single person on there who has a conflicting uh setting setup if you will um and the way that i broke that down when i was learning it was I went through as many videos as I could find and I wrote down every setting that I could, that, that was discussed. And then I took the average and I found that middle point for your gain, your color gain, color limit, um, what palette color that I saw was used most. And I based all of my settings via that 
and then I play it in, you know, very small, you know, adjustments from there until I kind of fine tune what, what I want to look at. So I, 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 I kind of, I like how your mind works here. So when you're going out and you're breaking down a lake and, and hopefully next year, maybe you'll be a boater on the BFL side. Are, are you playing the probability scenario about just catching a solid limit versus hunting a big dog? Cause I feel like a lot of guys, and this is kind of like how my mind works where a lot of guys like to go in there and be like, well, listen, I'm fishing to win, whatever the hell that means. And I'm going to swing for the fence. Whereas to me, it's like, you know, what you got to do, you got to go up there and you got to be consistent and you look for the consistent fight because you can whittle through them because you don't know what the lake's going to be like. It could be a bad day and that's huge for you. Like how does your mind approach breaking down a lake? I always have more of a, um, a conservative approach if I'm fishing from the back of the boat. Um, if I'm fishing as a boater, say with the, um, you know, I, I absolutely love fishing the Sunday morning series on Lake Anna and I fish them alone just so I can get better at being more efficient. Um, but just for breaking down a, a tournament like that in the summer, I like to find as many offshore spots that I possibly can find. Um, and I will run through and I'll spend 10 to 15 minutes on key pieces of structure, whether it be a hard spot or, uh, you know, I've got one spot that's a sunken sailboat or, you know, a hard spot on a point or a brush pile. And the more spots that I can make and the more pinpoint casts to a, to a general spot versus an area, that's going to give me an opportunity to actually be able to catch a limit in, you know, less than five hours. For, you know, because those tournaments only go for five, you know, from 6 a.m. to 11. It, it's kind of like I run that as a, a workout exercise for tournament fishing. Hmm. That's really interesting. Now, what is your plans in the future then for your business right now? Like, where do you see yourself in, you know, two, three, four years? Uh, I would say three years will be very close to full time, not if not full time. Congratulations. Thank you. That's actually my plan too, is I want to be like four to five years. I want to be yeeted from corporate done with that. And I'm doing this full time. <laughs> That's kind of like my hope as well to be just completely in the fishing industry. Um, and, and I know you're going to get there because like you do a fantastic job. You, 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 you really work your butt off. You have a clean, you do clean work. I, are you ever thinking about eventually getting employees to help you with this at all? Is that going to be in the future as well? No, it's not out of the question. Um, I, I definitely would want to have someone um, who comes from the uh, electrical construction industry. Um, I, I, I would not want anyone dealing with clientele who do not have experience in electrical work. Um, I want someone who has credentials similar to mine, just so I have confidence and my client has confidence that they're going, they're going to get a good product because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like when we were talking on the financial aspect of it, you know, you're spending a good amount of money on shallow water anchors, or, I mean, even your trolling motors. Now you can't get less than power pole, like power pole trolling motor, five grand, baby. Yeah. Yeah. On the move. The, uh, I mean, Dude. you know, your old Trex is the most affordable at, at yeah. this point and i mean that's still around 2800 give or take mm -hmm. so you know you want to have your equipment installed right if you're not mechanically inclined or don't feel comfortable doing so and you know when it comes back to your electronics you also want that done done correctly as well because you have you know even the transducer placement is something that does that gets overlooked um so yeah, when it when it would come to having uh, employees or having assistant uh, assistance with for for this this type of work, it it would have to be someone who is has credentials similar to mine and and someone that we could, you know, both myself and our our clientele would would feel comfortable with. Greg, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm assuming that you're not completely jam packed. So if people want to get in contact with you to get their kayak in their boat and whatever have you, what is the best way they can get in contact with you? Uh, they can email us at new horizon boat builds at gmail.com uh, or visit our website. 
at New Horizon Boat Builds uh, LLC uh, dot com. Um, those are the two best avenues to get in contact with us. Guys, again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today, including ways that you can get in contact with New Horizon Boat Builds. He does a phenomenal job. Um, this, I don't think we mentioned, we probably should. You are just uh, north of Lake Anna or south of Lake Anna? Uh, we are southwest of Lake Anna by about 55 minutes. Uh, we're about 20 minutes outside of Charlottesville. There you go. Just uh, probably should have mentioned that at the beginning. But anyway, so now you know where his location is. So you can make that drive. Again, link in the episode description and everything we talked to you about to get that today. You could subscribe to the channel. That really helps me out in the algorithm. Leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. We are one of the top 200 wilderness and outdoor podcasts in nationally ranked. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will